Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. Albert Einstein. Welcome to Translating Illness. I am Marta Arnaldi, Lamy Research Fellow at the Queen's College, University of Oxford. Today, I have the immense pleasure to introduce Banashela Rijani and Vernon David, who will explore and in fact enact the very notion that has inspired this series, the idea that there exists a continuum between science and art and that translation enables this constant flux. Banashela Rijani is director of the Center for Therapeutic Innovation, University of Bath. She is head of the Cell Biophysics Laboratory at Cancer Research UK. She holds adjunct professorships with Stony Brook University, New York, and with the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Banashe studied English and comparative literature at Paris and Oxford. She is also a published poet. With Vernon David, whom I'll introduce in a minute, she has performed her poetry at various venues across the world. Much of her work, both as a leading scientist and as a poet, examines the collision of matter and spirit, the rational and the irrational. Bernard David is a cellist and a composer. He studied cello at the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, Maryland, and holds a master's in composition from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His chamber music has been performed in the UK, France, Greece, Italy, and the US. So before starting, I would like to kindly ask everyone to keep their mic and video off during the presentation. Also, the event will be recorded and there will be space at the end for a Q&A with today's guests. Please feel free to type questions and thoughts in the chat. And now I leave the stage and the page to Banashe and Vernon. Let us follow them in the steps of what has been defined as the eternal tango of art and science. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Marta, for giving us the opportunity for Vernon, David, and I to come back as a continuum and Bear with me, all of you, because we have a lot of acrobatics today. So I will now share the screen. So Continuum is in the form today of translating symbolism into precision medicine. Unity in scientific disciplines is broken due to not being able to sustain our common tongue. Today, to reacquire this common tongue, we need to be able to translate from one discipline to the next. To translate, we need to know how to exist at the interface. To remain at each of the interfaces from mathematics to the physical sciences, engineering, life sciences, and medicine, we need to imagine how we can relate each scientific concept. The unification of these relationships needs to understanding how we can implement precision in the common tongue. The symbolist movement where emotion was evoked through images at the interface of matter and spirit. Precision in rhythm and tone in poetry preserved the interface between matter and spirit, or shall we say, space. It is at all interfaces that creation occurs. Our Western forefathers knew how to relay at the interface. An example is the Timaeus and Critias by Plato. And while I talk about this, I think I have to allow a lot of people in. <laughs> <laughs> so, Timaeus and Critias. What are the three dialogues that 
they are actually talking about. The usage of the three dialogues of Socrates, Timaeus and Critias to understand complexity of the microscopic in order to explain the macroscopic. For this, there is a requirement of translating the fundamental concepts. Dialogue of Socrates. Timaeus introduces the idea of a creator and speculates on the structure and composition of the physical world. The receptacle, space and matter, is that which the phenomena occur and out of which they are formed. Here we can elude as the symbol. We can draw the analogy occurrence of specific conformations of proteins in space, the cell. From these conformations, the regulation of signaling pathways are formed, which is matter. The effects of science and the arts are similar as they influence and record profound changes in consciousness communication pathways that lead to consciousness of macroscopic systems arise from microscopic systems such as the cell. Interaction of various types of molecules ensure that information is being communicated correctly. So an example of this is precision in molecular communication. So the question that we had is that if we take this one class of molecules that you can see on your left hand side, which is a type of lipid, and remove this one type of molecule from the cell, which is the space where communication occurs in a very precise manner from a specific location, we ask the question, would it deform space? would it create anomalies in space by the lack of communication? The precision that we used, the methods of chemical biology, allowed us to answer such a question. And what you're going to see, while I let more people in, <laughs> what you're going to see in the next slide is um, a movie from a PhD student of ours, who wanted to ask this question, Natalie's question was that how can she deform communication by removing this one type of molecule? And what you're going to see is going to be vesicles that are the mode of communication in the cell, in membrane trafficking, and then these vesicles are deformed to tubules by the removal of this one particular compound. Now, this was a project that Vernon and I um, started at the Guild Hall of Music when we were in London. And the project was based on trying to explore how we can communicate with young musicians about cellular communication and whether through writing a particular score, whether they can look at the score and listen to the music and try and understand what is happening at the cellular level.
So precision in molecular communication determines cellular morphology. As you can see, the vesicles became tubules and then eventually the cells died. So this is a parallel. The manner whereby these nodes interact, they form structures which follow a particular path where their assembly stimulates collective consciousness. I thought I might say something about how I constructed the music for the cell film you just saw and for the desolation poem which you will see. Uh, in the figure you see, there are two sets of six notes. And they're identical in that they, the shape of the two chords is the same, but they share none of the same pitches and combine to form the entire chromatic scale and all the intervallic possibilities. The chord has a particular sound quality and character that creates a recognizable core sound or harmonic grammar. It's a field of deep relationships that go from the micro level to the macro level. Such a method gives the intuition and unconscious something to rely upon for coherence in a large chromatic complexity such as this. What occurs moment by moment is reflected in the larger form. Looking at the second transposition of the set, it's easy to notice that a very slight change, uh, altering the A flat to an F, will give you of all of the modal scales, which would be all the white notes on the key piano keyboard, for instance. Um, and the two sets will share only one pitch then F in common, but this will still blend easily into the core sound as it shares so much in common with it. And this allows a wide range for the imagination as to gestures, rhythms, um, sounds, and melodies, all under the umbrella of a coherent pitch grammar. Uh, but like all things, it needs the unexpected for any real interest, so I stick to it 80 or 90 percent of the time. The piece is based not on these sets, but on the feeling of the poetic imagery. Form is about the conservation of energy. The relationships free things up to create the illusion of meaning. The illusion of meaning. Before I go to the illusion, can we be concrete? Could everybody turn off their mics and the videos except for Vernon and Marta before I carry on please I'll start again the illusion of meaning what does that in indicate metaphor and symbolism images in contradiction with the endeavor of maintaining emotional coherence and poetic rhythm for poetic rhythm induces perpetual listening and imagining. Desolation. What is it when the walls of a city wrap around you as a metal veil, leaving out astonished eyes, haunted by every brick at any corner? Why is it that the crickets are no longer heard in the city? The ones we caught with greed from the gardens and fed to the fire. Crickets peel out from grey shells, preparing for after death. These walls in grief incline towards me without complaint, awaiting. I dream of lovers and I. Every brick mumbles a song, plows names onto insignificant faces. Hazy lovers in sunstruck cafes, a mirage of laughters with condescending tones. Remember, under the tinted stars of childhood, crickets were an aberration to the cry of adults. Remember their echo in Ithaca, there they engulf sorrow. Here, the cobblestones crush metamorphosis. I look at the green beauty of Paris. I see nothing. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
The Images Movement, late 19th century, the likes of Baudelaire changed the static poetry into motion. And then afterwards, later on, the symbolist, T.S. Eliot, coined the subject of objective correlative. In an essay, he had critically written about Shakespeare's Hamlet, alluding to the fact that Hamlet showed his emotions too openly in the way he felt in society, and that perhaps more objective correlative would have been required for Hamlet's emotions not to be so naked for the readers. So what is this concept of objective correlative? It's a positive connection between emotion, the object, image, or the situation in the poem that conveys the emotion. So I have um, close scientific colleagues who've always asked me, um, what is it that makes you think about the scientific complexity when you are either writing poetry or reading it? And I'd like to point out this example of how actually it works in my mind and, and why I need both to be able to pursue complexity in science. And this is an extract from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, East Coker. And what happens once I read this to you is that it actually brings out the concept that we cannot have preconceptions or prejudice. We have to be humble in front of nature's design with the final knowledge that we own nothing. But we are part of this complexity. We are passengers through this complexity. This will allow us to go and understand how we have to confront complexity. To arrive where you are, to get from where you are not, you must go by a way wherein there is no ecstasy. In order to arrive at what you do not know, you must go by a way which is the way of ignorance. In order to possess what you do not possess, you must go by the way of disposition. In order to arrive at what you are not, you must go through the way in which you are not. And what you do not know is only thing you know. And what you own is what you do not own. And where you are is where you are not. And this is a portrait of the complexity. Some can allude to this as an electronic um, configuration of a platform where you have resistance capacitance and the way that they communicate with each other. But this is, this is sort of illustrates to all of you of how complex it is and how do these molecules interact? How do they communicate from one side of the cell to the other? And all the acronyms that the biologists come up with, which are the names of the various proteins or the lipids or the carbohydrates. Now, how do we enlighten this complexity? And the moment that we say enlighten, we think of light, and in think of light, we think of optics. How do we use optics 
to actually be able to have some precision in this complexity and to be able to go forward with that. So this complexity and its optics translates into precision and what we call functional states of how protein interact as opposed to the amount of protein. These optical platforms that we have created actually allow us to be more precise and uniquely monitor these intercellular engagements and complex formations. And at the end, it allows us to translate into patient stratification, quantification of prognosis. So an example of this are the more recent treatments that happen in cancer, which is immunotherapy. So the question is, which patients benefit with such therapy? So what is immunotherapy? It's a type of cancer treatment that helps patients' immune system to fight cancer. Because the cancer is quite clever. Solid tumors are very clever, and they basically cloak themselves, and they become invisible to the immune system in order to be able to survive. So immunotherapy basically tries to reverse that, and it uncloaks it. So there's a new generation of immunotherapy that are called the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And these are antibodies that remove these breaks that are created by these type of proteins that regulate the breaks and make it um, basically in such a way that the immune system then can go and um, attack the cancer. Now, as all things, there are discrepancies. And where are the discrepancies? The discrepancies lie between the type of analysis. How do we analyze in the clinic and with pathologists and others? And the discrepancy lies in the fact that we analyze the amount of protein rather than its behavior and how it interacts with its partner or how it changes shape. So we don't usually analyze this functional state. And this is what our optical platform allows us to do, that it measures the way it functions. So this is really important because then it allows us to indicate whether the protein in question is switched on or off, or is it regulated or dysregulated, and therefore determining its functional impact on the tumor survival. So, in a little bit more detail, what is one type of these regulatory immune checkpoint? It's program death ligand 1 and program death 1. And this is very important because these two proteins have to interact. When they interact, they suppress the immune and it's favorable for the tumor survival. What do we do? We use in our optical platform, we use a ruler, we use a chemical ruler to be able to measure the distance that this cartoon shows you here between the two proteins, very small distances. And the measurement of these distances allows us to understand how they behave, how they interact, or how do they change their shape, and allows us to be more precise and quantify and better stratify. And here you can see an example of what this does. So you can see on your left-hand side the images that we obtain through our microscopes. And what you see here that I indicate is the fluorescent image of one of the proteins. And this is the fluorescent image of the other protein in lung cancer metastatic patients. And then when you try and measure the distance between these proteins, you can see it in this pseudo-colored image. And where you see high levels of orange is where there's more interaction. So what do the clinicians do? They take this information and they translate it into what they call survival curves. And you can see the difference between these survival curves is on the top curve is when you use our optical method, you can distinguish between patients that have a high or low level of interaction of the protein. But if you use the way that is classically done and just measure the amount of protein, you do not distinguish between 
the patients that have high or low amounts. What does this translate into? Immunotherapy treated patients with metastatic lung cancer with a low extent of ligand receptors, so the two proteins interact, show significantly a worse outcome. That is a surprise when you use precise methods because this is the result of precision. So the result of precision as compared to one treatment fits all, global statistics, as opposed to precision medicine that leads into personal diagnostics. And the right treatment for the right patient is where we're all hopefully heading towards. Because if we don't do that, the result of it is another Parisian moment. On a spring day, where all the green chestnut leaves reflect your eyes, on a day where bright shades burst from every street corner, the sun struck our winter skin. Cafes exploded with youngsters lip to lip. Paris, which carried your beauty of May 68, froze into a frame. On such a day, where I had no desire to cry, they put you in a box without a smile. She will never leave. I heard the nailing of the wood. Since that yellow, trembling day, your voice tortures my brain. I turn around, no one but a vacated space. Paris, had you not promised moments of love? Images in Contradiction. Now, there are aspects of this Images in Contradiction which may not follow objective correlative. And these are the aspects that are not conveying emotion, but as in the state of Hamlet, they are more obvious emotions in society. In the concepts of Eastern poetry, which is intercalated with music and words, which is also intercalated with philosophy, perhaps objective correlative is not the main way forward, but tone and rhythm are to be able to interact with the music. So the next two poems, you will see that this intercalation occurs between Vernon and I. Now, if we were in a non-virtual world, you would see Vernon and I side by side and playing and reciting together. And we have an example of that, which is the last poem called Stone. But for now, we do the separate. So, walled inside the night. Abandoned in the cold, he flickers his Bible to unresolved pages. He lies beneath the rusted cross, looks up to a constellation of shooting stars, wishes drift into an endless night. Meandering in an altered life, he remembers the vanishing reflection of an eagle spread. I am where I was, in trenches of indecision, all barriers broken, where la pensée féminine ou masculine have become a reduction of apprehensive gazes. Still, through this night, the pages of his Bible flicker.
Stone. The stone had a dream. Radha and Krishna were forgotten as temple ruins, where her bosom strangled him until he transfigured to another human figure. The sky had a dream. It was turned upside down into a lake where roots became lines crawling on the moon. A lake had a dream. It was showered by acorns from the cherry blossoms of its shore. The rock had a dream. It was touched by the summer wheat undulating orange into green. A piece of ceramic had a dream. It was freed from a moss to stroll on a sand-blown carpet of stone. A man, his dry lips brushed against flowers of emptiness. A woman had a dream. Her gaze knotted into the grey eyes of an owl. The man had a dream with the woman. They were carved back into the scent of the stone. And the final dialogue, we go back to Plato, Socrates. It is through creating the environment of the Agora that we can reach an entente across the fictional borders of science, philosophy and art. We need all three to appreciate and understand molecular evolution and translate into undoing the human malaise. I thank you all for coming. And sorry, there were some technical masses that were occurring because I had to let everybody in. But Marta, I'm going to now go back to giving the host to Kira. I can't find Kira. Kira, where are you? <laughs> I can't find Kira. I think we're going to leave Kira where is wherever she is. I think we. I'm going to. I, okay. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I'm going to give you the host. Kira, have you got? Are you host now? Yes. Yes, yes. I can see that. All right. Then you can take the questions if there are any questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Banashi and Bernon, for uh, this uh, um, yeah, amazing performance uh, and uh, uh, lecture uh, and uh, exploration uh, of borders. Really, we went uh, through the uh, extreme lens of knowledge today, I think. Um, so uh, I am very happy to um, take any questions from the audience. Um, Yes, I can. I can confirm that the video, the, the event, will be recorded, so you will be able to watch and watch in your own time. Are there any questions that we can uh, uh, ask Panache? While we wait for uh, people to uh, to send their questions through, um, I would like to ask Banache uh, like a, a, to share with us a few thoughts on what I know is a very very dear uh, topic for her. Um, and that is uh, the ways in which uh, creativity and creation comes into being uh, as a bridge uh, between uh, uh, disciplines and knowledge. So would you like to share us some thoughts on the process of creation of your own poetry and scientific discoveries? So the, my brain is a funny brain. Um, well, my PhD supervisor, Dominique Pochon, knows about this. Um, it's an anecdote um, that I can yeah, give as, as an example. He asked me to write my PhD in four weeks. And in order to be able to address that four weeks, um, because I wasn't going to say no, that I can't write the PhD in four weeks, I, the only way that that would basically allow me to do this was to go and think on the creative way 
and I gave you an example of what would happen when you read when I read Eliot specifically or any of the symbolist post symbolist poet it it allows you to think in in the bigger space it in it unhinges what is usually hinged and locked um, which is fright fright in trying to understand what are the results and what do they mean a lot of the young students are always worried about not finding the same thing as God knows how many other publications. So they don't look at what nature provides for them. I think um, allowing me to write allows to be the creativity to work with the other side of um, my mind. And that basically unlocks and allows to write. So that is one of the ways that I managed to write the PhD in four weeks. Um, and the other ways is that whenever I, I have to write or I have to read before I write any scientific paper because it's I'm very sensitive to the technique that is used in literature to be able to write sci science, which is not obviously literary. So those are the what 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 on blocks and of course working with Vernon, um, which is why we talk about collective consciousness is that the music that intercalates with the words, it also unlocks that process of creativity. This is, Marta, I think what we want to do um, at this interface of science and art as a project with others to be able to allow this um, to, to actually to, to happen. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we could talk uh, for much longer, but yes, I, I would like to give us, leave some space to the audience. So we have a question from Drago, I think. Um, uh, in many fields, uh, we talk about ontology, you know, uh, and uh, we, he's asking, this person, they're asking, will we ever be able to have uh, like a comprehensive ontology? i.e. an ontology that uh, could be multimodal uh, and able to cross uh, and uh, crisscross language, music, movement and dance. Vernon, do you want to answer that? Because it's Draga answering that question. <laughs> uh, I'd almost, I was so prepared for you to be answering it that I'd almost <laughs> need it. Perhaps you can fill me in again on uh, more precisely what the question is. Just review the question and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to try. Absolutely. So uh, the question is, uh, if I understand it correctly, is it, uh, are we able to achieve like a comprehensive ontology? Ontology is being uh, like a, a field or an approach uh, crisscrossing many domains. So we will have, we will have ever be able uh, to have like a, a, a all embracing ontology. I, I don't know. It's 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 such an interesting question that it's um, I almost don't want to answer. You know, it's so interesting. But I, I I'm I'm not sure. Um, I feel like in each each one of these disciplines of writing and the discipline of music making, um, in this case poetry and music, in, in some ways they already are the same, or in some way they already are are total. It just it depends on what direction you're looking in. If you look at any kind of um, human expression and how that expression goes with nature, that um, you know we're part of nature. So, like for instance, when I was talking about the sets, the idea that in a way it's 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 a type of language, and the unconscious sort of glues itself to that language and emerges. And if I have something that's set, like let's say pitch relationships, then um, from that my unconscious then is more able to um, be imaginative because there's something it doesn't have to be con as concerned with. But I think that, that that sort of already is the umbrella. Like the, I think the umbrella is, is already there. It just depends on, um, on how aware you are of looking, you know. Thank you, thank you. Yes, there is also a second question um, about symbol. I think it, it should be correlated, linked to the previous one. A symbol is a so low dimensional, such a low dimensional representation. Perhaps we should only consider a high dimensional symbols crossing physical and virtual words. It's relating. I don't know if you have any thoughts. No, no more questions. So this was like a thought related to the previous uh, um, one. 
don't know if you would like to add anything. Otherwise, while we wait, I, I would like to uh, ask both Fernon and Banache to spend a few words on this, uh, on what has been considered for so long, at least uh, since uh, the advent of Romanticism and the Industrial Revolution, these two cultures, science and art, as two opposing systems. Uh, whereby science uh, uh, celebrates uh, final results and success, uh, whereas uh, art, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, explores the journeys that brings towards uh, uh, these final results uh, and the way in which translation bridges the two visions. You want to go first or do you want me to go first, Vernon? You go ahead. <laughs> so I, I think the bridges, as I said, the 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 bridges there and the translation, as I, as I was saying, I think at the beginning, it's really at the interface. And it's not, there's, there's, the interface is where um, most of this creation and the overlap of the translation occurs. So we, we're in an era that everything needs to be separated because of lack of time or because the way everything is. But doesn't necessarily we don't need to separate I don't I don't I particularly don't understand why there is a separation I think there is a separation because people think there is no time but they go hand in hand I don't see a difference between the creativity that we go through in art or the creativity of of, of the science as I um, you know as you have seen through through this you know half an hour um, I don't see the difference uh, I think scientists may argue with me that um, science, science, of course, is hypothesis driven and art is not hypothesis driven. And they may argue um, if they're not at the interface of science and art, that one is subjective, the other one is objective. But there comes a point that that subjectivity and objectivity actually mix. And that's where the translation occurs. Yeah, and, exactly. and it's the same translation that occurs from fundamental research into what you call the clinic. So in, into a much more macro system, which is, is dealing with much more grander phenomena than, yeah. than the molecular level. I really like the way in which you uh, speak uh, comparatively about time and space. I think you mentioned that cell is the space where communication occurs, but yet humanity and translation is what uh, study, you know, it's a study of communication. And then you say, the separation between these two domains occurs because of an issue of time. I think it, there's so much richness uh, in this that uh, still uh, uh, we should explore. Yeah. So if um, we don't have any more questions... Well, I think there are... Oh, there is another one. Sorry, that's correct. From Stephanie. Uh, a question for Banache, possible. Uh, Paris features prominently in your poems as a paradoxical symbol connecting hope and love on one hand and isolation on the other. Can you discuss in your research a biological correlate to the bridging of opposites? Beautiful question. <laughs> so, I think for Paris, it wasn't biological in Paris. It was pure engineering. So, <laughs> so Paris was engineering. And for, to escape from the solid engineering, chemical engineering, we ran to the comparative literature and studied with Stephen Romer at Nanterre. And so, so that was Paris, is that, um, so the creativity in, in chemical engineering when we were studying it was not at the level that um, my colleagues today in engineering uh, and how they're create creative right now it's very different to the creativity we went through when we were studying engineering in Paris so we ran to, the, to for hope into the comparative literature to actually um, yes to be inspired because they, we were inspired in comparative literature and came back to the engineering so I hope that answers the question <laughs> I think maybe yeah. Again, the la the last bit I think is very is very interesting. Uh, she's asking whether in your research, uh, you also in biology and physics uh, and cancer research, there there are ways in which you also tackles opposites, like 
Paris as a symbol of this merging of opposites. Is there anything, any topic, any entity in your scientific research that also works as a dialectic uh, conflation of opposites? Yeah, constantly. And it, and, it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where I am. It's a complete opposition. So those who know me, I, I don't accept the, the norm. I don't, I don't swim with the same, at the same stream. I go in the opposition because I think it comes back to Eliot's part of his poem is that I go in with not expecting anything. Yes, there is hypothesis, but I don't expect because the design is humble because I know, as, I, as I've said to many of my colleagues, there is one thing that is sure is our end point. And I think that because we all reach that one singular end point, whether it's a cell which is um, a cell death or apoptosis or the human who goes to the process of death, then, and that's an end point. So for, as, as a scientist, that's an end point. Therefore, f to, because I know that there is an end point, I don't go in with any prejudice, so I, I reach the complexity and the and the opposites by by using that. So I'm not surprised why a lot of the hypotheses don't work, or if they do work, then well, we're lucky. I think most of the time, if any of the hypotheses that we set up and they work, they think the way that we think is work. I think we we should be very grateful because we've just understood one picometer of that complexity so that's what drives me to understand where, where we're going and i think it it suits all the complexities of many pathologies <laughs> open-mindedness and i don't own anything i never own anything nature owns it mm -hmm. thank you Panache. i hope stephanie that was uh answer your question um otherwise feel free to ask <laughs> and uh Oh, we have another uh, message, another question. Uh, these days, there is a, a trend within academia to bring the arts into conversation with STEM in order to sort of legitimize the arts and justify funding artistic endeavors. STEM fields often have access to more funding and the arts are less recognized as valuable in their own right. Of course, it is important to recognize these real and meaningful bridges between the arts and sciences, but how do you both view this relationship between arts and sciences and how it affects the way the arts are valued and valorized? So, Vernon, I'm going to let you say something about this because it's very important as a, as, as a musician and where you are sitting right now to, to, to talk about this. But I just want to say that unfortunately, um, valorizing or giving value to the art is a very inappropriate way because it's innate. Art is part of nature, it has its own value. If politicians don't value the arts, and they, they certainly don't value science, and they separate one and the other because they fund the sciences because it brings to some sort of technological or they think in their minds that it might cure something. And, and we are in the middle of the pandemic, and all of you know that there are so many misinterpretations and so many mistranslations of both the language and the science and the environment that is, it's very, very upsetting. So, um, and I think there is, there's the same natural value in the arts and the sciences. They should not be differentiated. And I, I guess we do have to go back, Martha, to the Medici era, to the Renaissance, because before the Renaissance, this is these are all the type of problems that were occurring, and then the Renaissance happened. I don't know if we ever will go through a Renaissance. I hope we do one day. But if we ever do, there might be some hope. But we're in the Dark Ages, so... And there, therefore, this present comment that, that there is more or less value. So it's, 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 to me, it's totally a mistake. And this, this is why it was so important to actually be able to give this lecture talk or symposium. Vernon, do you want to talk about that? Because it's very important. Yeah, I mean, when we were talking about science and that thing, I, I know that it sounds like that matter often behaves like soul and soul often behaves like matter, uh, which is sort of part of the of the quantum idea. Uh, and I think that as soon as you start separating things and you get science on one side and you get other kinds of human expression on another side, 
um, you know, both sides are suffering. There's a little question of that. And um, as for politics and funding, you know, it's just a great mystery. I mean, it, it, it's because at this point, sometimes they'll bow to science and say, well, it's more important for um, people to learn mathematics, people to learn these sort of subjects. And so um, people in high school and everything are spending vast amounts of time now um, in school. I remember when um, I was in elementary school in the 60s, we, we had the entire summer in which to you know do what we wanted, make music, um, read, explore other things. And I think that um, in a kind of ambition that's sort of going in the wrong direction, um, I think that this is this is a, a bad direction to go. I think that somehow we need to get back to um, to some unity in this for both sides to um, really make progress. Thanks, Vernon. I think this is very true because the tragedy is not only that the humanities and humanities research are not recognized as valuable in their own right, mm -hmm. but the tragedy is also that many people do not see science as an act of creation. Right. So benefits uh, and uh, pros and cons both sides here absolutely agree with you uh, and exactly as people say in the chat uh, art is too valuable to be left to, to be left to a question of money but also science is too valuable to be left to a question yeah, of yeah. it's uh, yes absolutely so um yes uh, are there any other questions Otherwise, I would like just to conclude, uh, uh, well, first of all, to thank Vanashe, uh, Vernon, and Kira behind the scenes and all the participants. Um, but I would like, uh, uh, like to, to, to leave you with, uh, with a thought uh, taken from uh, uh, Tom McLeish's book, The Poetry and Music of Science, Comparing Creativity in Science and Art. It is a beautiful book published by OUP a few years ago. So the book ends uh, by developing uh, the thesis that creativity of all kinds contributes to a healing of a broken or incomplete human relationship within the world, or with the world. So today's event has acted, I hope, as a beautiful illustration of the complexities and indeed great human depth and need of this process. Creativity heals. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.